Welcome to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. Today, part two of our examination of the journal's racist history and what we can learn now. There are still such deep legacies from the past in our present practices. And it's the past that's in the present that matters. Evelyn Hammonds joins me again. She's a professor of the history of science and African-American studies at Harvard University and a contributor to the journal's historical injustice series. And also with us again is Dr. David Jones. He's a professor of the culture of medicine at Harvard and an editor of the series. Let's start by talking about the era after World War II. This is a period when the New England Journal of Medicine becomes a central publication, not only for doctors, but also policymakers and researchers. And it's a time when healthcare really begins to be centered at hospitals, but it's also a time of segregation. Well, remember, this is the era of Jim Crow. And so many hospitals even in places like New York City, which is not a Jim Crow state, are still segregated. But in the South, there was absolute segregation between white wards and black wards, between nurse training schools at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. The black nurses were trained on one side of the huge hospital complex. White nurses were trained on the other side of this hospital complex. They never saw each other. White and black nurses did not treat the same patients at all. This building is shaped in a way that as a white person, you could graduate from Grady Hospital Nursing School and never see a black patient. Rigid segregation meant that in many places throughout the American South and not just the South, black people simply had no access to hospitals because the funding of hospitals, certainly post-World War II, required enormous amounts of, of money. Uh, both federal money and philanthropic funds. The black community didn't have a generations of very, very wealthy people who could provide funds to hospitals. And so therefore, access to hospitals was profoundly inadequate for African-Americans. And it wasn't until the federal government moved in to say that those hospitals who will receive federal funds must desegregate. And it was only then When hospitals faced losing high levels of federal funding, that those hospitals did desegregate, and we have more or less some of the situation we see today. I would say still not completely fully integrated in many respects, but at least far, far better than what happened in the early post-World War II period. I mean, just to to emphasize the the point that Professor Hammonds had been making, the federal government's policy immediately after World War II was a segregationist policy. So in 1946, Congress passes the Hill-Burton Act, which makes large amounts of federal funding available for hospitals. And in a concession to Southern Democrats, the Hill-Burton Act allowed that money to be spent on hospitals that were segregated. And so the federal government is actively financing the creation of segregated hospitals, 1940s, 1950s. And it's only with the passage of Medicare in 1965 that you see hospitals were given a choice. If you want federal funding, then you have to desegregate, at least in principle. In practice, remains a question. And of course, in this same period when hospitals were largely segregated, doctors continued to approach research and medicine with a lot of internalized notions of race. How did this evolve as medicine evolved? Over the course of the 20th century, the kinds of diseases that are common in society start to shift. And so you see rising concern about problems like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, substance use, you still see the same patterns of racial thought in medical theory and practice. Doctors would actively look for differences in the incidence and prevalence of disease between different racial groups, and then give explanations that foregrounded these biological genetic notions of race. And so one of the famous examples of this is what happened with a group who at the time were referred to the Pima Indians in Arizona. Now the the preferred term is the Akamo Odom community. And a series of studies were done in the 1950s and the 1960s that led medical researchers to conclude that this group had the highest prevalence of diabetes seen anywhere in the world. And so first they start talking about Pima diabetes, 
as if it's a distinct phenomena. And the interpretation is there must be something inherent to this group of humans such that they get more diabetes than anyone else in the world. And so NIH got interested, and there was a research study that was established that ran for decades. And the real hope was that they would find the genes that determined who did or did not get diabetes. And decades later, you know, fast forward to the early 2000s, and they still hadn't found the genes that would explain diabetes in this community. And two interesting things had happened in the meantime. One was the recognition that all humans are really susceptible to diabetes. And the ways in which the the Pima had seemed distinctive in the 1950s and 1960s were not so true by the 2000s. There were lots of people who had really high rates of diabetes, and they were no longer the group that had the highest rate of diabetes. But the most interesting observations came from outside the medical profession, really from anthropologists, who said, hold on here. You geneticists totally misunderstand what's going on. This community of people is not one community who lives in Arizona. This was a community of people who moved freely across what's now the U.S.-Mexican border for centuries. And so the people you are seeing in Arizona have close relatives on the other side of the border. So let's look at them too. And if you look at the the members of this community who are living in Mexico, they did not have high rates of diabetes. And so if you have genetically the same group of people that's been split in half, and half of them have lots of diabetes, and half of them don't, it's really hard to make a case that this population is genetically predisposed to diabetes. But that's what the American researchers had done for decades. The ways in which the questions, the research questions that the scientists were engaged in trying to answer, which were based on a fundamental flaw at the very beginning of it, that they understood who these people were. And they did not understand who these people were. And they did not understand how these people were connected to other people in more or less the same region. And those things took backseat to how they went about their research, whether or not it was rigorous or robust or whatever. But the fundamental premise was, we know who these people are and we understand their cultures and their lived experiences, which they did not. And so one of the things that's so interesting about the the diabetes case is because so much had been written about this group for so long, it still circulates in the medical literature. So there was a study that was published a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine based on an analysis of the medical curricula at University of Pennsylvania. In at least one class, the professor continued to talk about Pima diabetes as an example of a genetic cause of a disease in a minority community. So the, the, the idea continues to circulate even after the evidence base for it has, has collapsed. So that pattern of thinking continues, but the response to it has evolved. So tell us what you found. So there was a very interesting article that gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1990 from researchers from the Department of Health in Arkansas, that if you look at white people and black people who are admitted to these nursing homes who don't have tuberculosis, and if you follow them over time, the black nursing home residents were more likely to acquire tuberculosis than the white people were. And the conclusion of this article was that this proves it, black people really are more susceptible to tuberculosis. And that's the article that gets published by the New England Journal of Medicine. Well, by the 1990s, when you publish that kind of thing, you're going to get pushback. And so the journal published a series of really angry letters to the editor. And there were many critiques that were suggested of this finding, but the most basic one was just because these people are in the same nursing home doesn't mean that they're being treated equally. It was very easy to imagine that if you were in a nursing home in Arkansas, in a publicly funded nursing home in 1990, maybe the black and white patients weren't actually treated in the same way. Or at the time of admission, maybe the health status was different. Maybe on arrival, their health status was compromised not because of some genetic liability, but because they had lived their lives in a racist society. And that's why their health was compromised. And that's why they were getting tuberculosis at higher rates. And one of the letter writers really put a fine point on this. And they said, well, look, if you focus on these inherent differences, you're robbing us of the desire to intervene. Whereas if you said, look, this evidence of difference is evidence of some problem that we can fix. So let's go forth and fix this. That is a much more valuable approach to take, where if you say, as had been said by this point for 180 years, 
well, of course there's more tuberculosis in black people. That's what we've always seen. There's nothing to be done about that. That really takes the doctors, the nursing home executives off the hook for doing anything about this problem. So there are real consequences to that kind of racialized interpretation of the data. So obviously there's a lot more awareness of how flawed these genetic and racialized theories were. And yet, as you point out, they continue to circulate. So what needs to happen? If you really want to change how doctors think, you need to have a deliberate research policy. And you need to think, okay, how can we generate evidence that's really going to undermine that faith? And you do see very good examples of that. And so one of my favorite ones is this article published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1997 about birth weight. And so researchers had recognized for decades that if you look at births in the United States to black women or white women, the babies born to black women tended to have lower birth weight. That's seen as a sign that something has gone wrong. And given habits of American medical thought, many people assume that, well, there must be a genetic cause of that. We know that black people and white people are different. There must be something wrong with these black mothers, and it must be genetic. And so these two researchers came up with a very clever study design. They're like, okay, let's do this. Let's look at children born to white women who had been born in the United States, to black women who had been born in the United States, and then to black women who had been born in Africa and had recently immigrated to the United States. And so if the genetic explanation is true, there's something about African ancestry that gives low birth weight, then you should see those three populations line up in a row with the healthiest birth weights in white people, low birth weights in African-American mothers, and even lower birth rates in these African-born, because they're the ones who are most purely genetically African. So what did they find? It turns out that the birth weights of U.S.-born white women and African-born black women were pretty similar. And that finding really drops a bomb on the idea that this could possibly be genetic. If it were about genetics, the African-born women would be having the worst pregnancy outcomes. And the ways in which that was theorized has so many issues in it. Number one, you know, the African-born women. Africa is the most genetically diverse continent on the planet. So there's a whole lot of issues going on there. And some people want to study the African Genome Project. There's no African genome. There will be multiple genomes multiple contributions to what constitutes the human genome from across the continent. And then, of course, we also use something called the white group that is never interrogated. So what constitutes the white group? What are the multiple ancestries from the people that we throw willy-nilly into something called white? And so this kind of result shows us that our perspective on racial differences blinded us to fundamental questions that should be asked. And so we can't settle for these default notions that have long uninterrogated histories as we do our work today. We have to ask these questions. What populations are we talking about? How do we define those populations? Are those definitions based on very serious analyses that include a host of things that in many strictly medical settings are not considered? Culture, environment, work, education, socioeconomic status, all these kinds of things that play a role in what we're seeing. And then do more careful work to try to discover the pathological and physiological issues of disease that we want to really understand. And that ultimately our goal is to relieve human suffering, but we we aren't doing it unless we take this much more seriously. So Dr. Jones, what's your view on what we can learn moving forward? The fact that almost any medical journal article divides its patient population into black versus white, reinforces the idea that these are two fundamentally different types of humans and the differences are relevant. And the fact that doctors care about this, you know, would just suggest that everyone else should care about this as well. And I've heard this from medical students at at Harvard Medical School. It can be exhausting to be a black or Hispanic or an indigenous medical student in a medical school in the United States in 2024. Because when they're taught about health disparities, they're exposed to a litany of ways in which their people are sicker than everyone else. That Black people have higher rates of this. Black people have higher rates of this. And then to the extent that a whole bunch of sort of old racist ideas continue to circulate, Black people have thicker skin. Black people are less sensitive to pain. 
the Pima diabetes is a true genetic problem. All of the signaling that medicine does by perpetuating these beliefs is toxic to society in general. It's toxic to future physicians who are trying to train in medicine. And so if we can figure out better ways to engage with difference, to write about difference, better ways to publish articles that take up questions of human difference, it has the potential to have an impact on medicine and society in many, many different ways. So Professor Hammonds, in conclusion, does this examination the journal is undertaking matter? Does this history matter? I think the history matters because there are still such deep legacies from the past in our present practices. And it's the past that's in the present that matters. And that if, if we don't deeply interrogate the kind of examples that David has described in detail and see the ways in which our continuing beliefs in fundamental biological differences between human groups that we have identified as races has actually been flawed and have not led to our deeper understanding of disease and differences in disease and susceptibility and other very important medical issues, then we continue to make the same mistakes when we approach trying to help relieve human suffering. That past is still active. It's not just in the past that we can forget about. We still have high rates of low birth rate among African-American women. We still have high rates of maternal morbidity among African-American women. We have a whole industry now dedicated to health disparities. But if we want to not have to continuing to deal with this issue of health disparities, then for me, it requires a reckoning of the past that says, how did we get here? And if we don't understand how we got here, we can't change the future. Thank you both so very, very much. Thank you. Th thank you. It's, it's terrific that the journal is giving these important problems this serious attention. That's Dr. David Jones, professor of the culture of medicine at Harvard University, and also Evelyn Hammonds, professor of the history of science and African-American studies at Harvard. We had help from our managing editor, Deborah Molina. Our engineer is Mike Toda. Next time, conversations about death. There's still a wide gap between doctors and their patients. We're offering patients hope that we're going to try and keep supporting them getting any care that's really going to help them, but also helping them get ready for the final stage of their life. If they're well prepared for it, I think that's one of the best things we can do for our patients. That's next time on Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gopin. Thank you.